All right, we are in our last chapter, our last unit of the semester, and we are in chapter 12. And this is about senses, and we are going to focus on uh, the anatomy of the eye and a little bit about sight. But what are the purpose of senses is to maintain homeostasis. It gives us information so that we can respond in an appropriate way to survive. There are two types, general and special. General senses are ones that are found all throughout the body. Um, and then specialized sense, uh, senses are where you have unique receptors confined to structures in the head. So eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. Um, so sensory receptors do get information from the environment and send that information to the central nervous system as we learned in the last unit. Um, and then we can respond to that, right? So the pathway of sensory information from those receptors to the central nervous system, um, be it the brain or the spinal cord, a stimulus first has to stimulate those sensory receptors. So um, this stimulus is going to cause a action potential and that is going to trigger or going to change the membrane potential inside the sensory neuron and that's going to cause an action potential that's going to run along the sensory neuron to the inner neuron and that's called transmission. And then interpretation occurs when the brain or spinal cord receives that information. So you can kind of see some stimulus, a pin prick, um, and there's little nerve fibers. And if enough information uh, is gone, if or ha is, uh, uh, occurs, the membrane potential will change charge enough to send an action potential called transmission to the spinal cord or brain for interpretation of that information. This is taste buds on the tongue and little chemicals. So we respond to specific stimuli in specific ways and um, there are five types of sensory receptors in the body and you'll need to know this for sure on the test. There's chemoreceptors. Remember that chemo means chemicals. So this is going to be smell, chemicals in the air, uh, chemicals on your tongue taste, and even oxygen concentration in your light blood. There are pain receptors called nociceptors. And they respond to tissue damage. So this could be pain due to electrical stimulation, heat, or physical mechanical pain. There are thermoreceptors that help you determine changes in the temperature of your environment. Mechanoreceptors is movement or forces, so this is pressure or touch, tension, uh, and stretch. And then the ones we'll focus on are photoreceptors that receive light in the eye. So sensation again occurs when action potentials make the brain aware of a sensory event. So you realize there's pain. Perception is when the brain um, interprets what that pain is so that you stepped on attack. And then projection is the process where the brain interprets the sensation um, and projects the sensation back to the parent source so you can locate where that pain is. Kind of crazy. Now here is information flow in special senses. We are going to focus right here on sight. So what's going to happen is light is going to hit the rods and cones in your retina. These are the unique sensory receptors that um, send information through the optic nerve fibers to the midbrain and cerebral cortex to um, where you see a small round red object and then you think about it, oh that's an apple. Sensory adaptation is interesting to me. It is the ability to ignore unimportant or continuous stimuli. And so it, it does involve a decreased response, um, usually after a prolonged um, stimulus. Um, 
so if you're going to sense it, you're going to need a stronger stimulus occur. So I think about, you know, I can go to sleep with light on, but if more light happens in the room, that might wake me up. Now, light's not a good example because your eyes are closed, but good examples are thermoreceptors and olfactory receptors, which is smell. Both of those are chemoreceptors. Synesthesia is really interesting. I met somebody like this once um, when I taught <clears throat> back at the old high school. Um, so this is where the brain interprets the stimu stimulus for a sense that's coming from another. The paint smelled blue. Um, the specific synesthesia that I encountered with someone is numbers had color. Um, words had color. So uh, it's kind of unique and it's due to a mutation in some genes. The most common form is this word. <laughs> where letters or numbers evoke certain colors, like I just said. And then in lexical gustatory synesthesia, a name gives a taste or smell. I just can't even imagine. I think that's really neat. So let's talk about sight and vision. You have these visual receptors found in your eye. Um, let's talk about just some accessory organs first, and then we'll get to the parts of the eye. Um, the upper and lower eyelids are used for protection. Your eyelashes help trap dust or uh, stu stuff in the air. Your lacrimal apparatus provides tears. And the extrinsic eye muscles, of course, move the eye. Your eyelids is where you're going to find the thinnest skin of your body. Um, it is the top layer of four layers of the eyelid. Right below the skin, you'll have the orbicularis oculi, which closes the lid and levator uh, palpebrae superioris, which opens the eye. Under the muscle, you'll have connective tissue um, that contains the tarsal glands, and that helps keep your eyelashes oiled, and then the uh, conjunctiva, which is the mucous membranes that lines the eye, and that's what gets infected when you have pink eye. And so you can see um, these layers and you see some muscle and connective tissues and um, so here's the upper eyelid it's closed and here's the lower eyelid and then that conjunctiva is all right in here so the lacrimal apparatus uh, remember lacrimal bone um, is you think of lacry, it makes tears. So that is your lacrimal gland. It's actually lateral to the eye, and it's what secretes tears, which, um, you know, goes into your eye, and then these tears can co be collected in the canaliculi, which goes to a lacrimal sac um, found in that lacrimal bone, and then it goes through another duct that empties into the nasal cav cavity. So that's why you... When you cry, you have a runny nose. Uh, lysosomes are enzymes found in tears that are antibacterial. So that's why when you get something in your eye, um, you know, you can cry and that um, enzyme can help break any bacteria that also got in your eye with, ever, with, with whatever debris went in there. And so here's where your tear duct is. And um, this all drains down into your nose. So the structure of the eye, it is hollow. It should be spherical. We'll find out that some people don't have perfectly spherical eyes and how that help changes their vision. The wall of the eye has an outer fibrous tunic. The middle layer is a vascular tunic and the inner layer is the nervous tunic. And so I do want you to study this picture. Um, you'll need to know it for the test. So um, major parts are the iris, the lens of the eye, uh, the pupil, and then the cornea, this clear part. And there's some fluid in here called aqueous humor. And then you have the anterior cavity, 
where the aqueous humor is found. And then you have vitreous humor all in here. Um, so your retina is right there. And then there's a choroid coat. We've seen choroid plexus in the brain. And then the sclera. Um, right here is the optic disc. And if you'll notice, so here's this optic nerve running along here. And it's going to have all these receptors on it, these rods and cones. But right here, there are not going to be any rods and cones. So this is your blind spot. And then here's a muscle, the medial rectus muscle, and the cavity where the vitreous humor is, and lateral rectus up here. So um, the outer fibrous tunic, it is made of the cornea and sclera. The cornea, you want to know what it is. It is that transparent window of the eye. So that clear glass structure and um, it helps focus the light and refracts the light so that you can focus um, on an object. The sclera is the white opaque um, stuff at the posterior of the eye and it's what helps protect the eye but also attaches muscle. So if you go back here, this white part of the sclera. The middle tunic has the choroid coat. We saw that in that picture, ciliary, uh, ciliary bodies right here um, and the iris. So the choroid coat provides blood and it also has some melanocytes to absorb some light because melanin, remember, is a pigment and all pigments absorb light. Your ciliary body uh, forms these rings to hold the lens and they can change the shape of it for focusing has ciliary muscles, you um, kind of can tell that they have, they look muscular. And the iris is the pigmented part of the eye and it controls the light entering the eye. The back, uh, sorry, the anterior cavity of the eye right behind, um, or right in front of the lens is filled with that aqueous humor we saw. So, right here, and then the lens is a transparent disc um, that lies behind the iris. It is kind of elastic and it helps focus rays. Now, accommodation is a change in the shape of the lens to view close objects. You're actually going to do a short, short lab on that, where the lens thickens and becomes more convex, and that uh, helps you focus on the close object. Um, when you use a microscope, you're doing a lot of accommodation and those muscles actually get tired. And so you can see how the lens is here and it can change shape to help focus light. And this is just showing those processes, those little muscles that help move and change the shape of the lens. And accommodation is showing the lens thick and thin for focusing on objects close and far away. The iris does control the amount of eye uh, light entering the eye. Um, the pupil is the window or the opening to the center of the iris. So when you're in dim light, your muscles will, uh, radial muscles will, di will help dilate the pupil so that it gets bigger and more light can come in, but if there's too much light, it will um, contract the circular muscles and the pupil will constrict to limit the amount of light coming in. Um, depending on the type of melanin and how much you have will determine the eye color of the iris. The aqueous humor fills that whole interior cavity of the eye. Um, it's secreted by epithelium of the ciliary bodies and it provides nutrients and helps maintain the shape. So here is the iris and how it can dilate in dim light, constrict in normal light, and in very bright light, it can constrict even more. I think this is interesting, the sympathetic nervous system. Remember, this is fight or flight where you dilate and you get ready. Parasympathetic um, 
not going to do very well fighting in bright, bright, bright light. And so this is just showing, here's that cornea and here's that aqueous humor right here, right in front of the lens. Um, and you can see fluid, this vitreous uh, humor flowing. And, and these are all those ciliary uh, muscles and processes that make up the ciliary bodies that help um, control the shape of the lens and the iris. So the posterior cavity has that vitreous humor, and it is a thick gel that holds that retina flat against that choroid coat and keeps the shape of the eye. And these are the layers of the retina. So you can see all these nerve fibers communicating with um, other neurons, and here's those rods and cones. Now rods are these longer ones, and uh, they are just for amount of light. So cones actually show color. So if somebody doesn't have the right amount of cones or they have a mutation in the shape of their cones, they won't see certain colors, which is like color blindness. So here are the layers of the eye, um, the posterior portion of it, what they do, the anterior portion of it, and what they do. So refraction is just bending of light. So the lens um, helps do this. A convex lens, like our cornea or the, the lens of our eye, causes light waves to converge. If you, we had convex lenses, it was actually caused the light, wage, light waves to diverge. I'll show you a picture of that. Now refraction in the eye, as the light enters the eye, the uh, cornea and lens refracts it and the image is focused on the retina upside down and reversed from left to right. But your brain flips all that um, correctly as you interpret it. So here's just showing refraction. As light goes through a panel of glass, it bends. And so here's showing our convex um, surface like our lens of our eye and how it can converge all the light to one point where if we had a uh, concave surface it would separate. So when we look at something light is bouncing off objects and coming to our eye and when it goes through our cornea through our lens it bends it and it all to one point where the image is flipped left and right, upside down, but the brain corrects it. Here's where I was talking about your eye should be a certain shape, but sometimes it's not. So farsightedness, normally, if you, if you have a normal shape eye, you do develop farsightedness later in age, um, usually after 45, and it's due to this loss of elasticity. And so you might have reading glasses to help you refract um, light better to focus. Um, nearsightedness is when your eyeball is too long. Farsightedness is where your eyeball is too short. And an astigmatism is a defect in the curvature of the cornea or the lens. And so part of it might be focused and part will not. So this is a normal eye. Light's coming in and bends to a focal point. If your eye is too long, um, what will happen is it comes in and bends just fine, but the point of focus isn't on the back of the eye like it's supposed to be. And if it's too short, its focus isn't even in the eye. So that's why um, you would use lenses to, to fix that. And this is just showing if you had a concave lens versus a con vex lens, how it can correct the point of focus. Remember I said that we have these rods and cones that are the photoreceptors of the neuron. And rods are longer and thinner, like we saw, and they do have a light sensitive pigment, pigment called rhodopsin. And you have hundreds of times more of these um, than cones. So you're more sensitive to light 
This is why when it's dark outside and you, your eyes adjust, you can see objects, but you can't tell really what color they are. Um, and so that's what rods do for us. They, we see in, in shades of gray. Cones are going to be shorter and they're kind of cone shaped, which is why they call them cones. And they are light sensitive. They have, uh, you have specific cones called um, erythrolabi, chlorolabi, and cyanolabi. Erythro is red, chloro is green, cyan is blue. And so this provides color and sharp images, but you have to have enough light, you know, to see it. And so here's these rods, and here's the cones. And here's pictures of them under a microscope. Stereoscopic vision pretty much just allows you to see depth and um, three interpret 3D objects. And so, um, because you're using both eyes, you can see depth. So, when the retina um, interprets some information and gives that to the optic nerve, that goes to the optic chiasma, to optic tracts, to the thalamus, to optic radiations, and finally the visual cortex of the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. You do not need to know all that, but I just want you to see where all this information is going um, from and to. And so here you can see it's pretty cool, these optic nerves going from one eye to another and then they split, they, they um, half each other, they cross over. And so at the optic chiasma and so Part of these stay on the right side and part goes to the left and vice versa. And then you go to the visual cortex of the occipital lobe and interpret that information. Remember, our, our, vis our vision area is our occipital lobe in the back of our head. And that is all for that lecture.